Good morning. You have a pinch hitter today. Uh, as the baseball season is starting, you get a pinch hitter. Uh, Scott uh, called me this week and said that um, Joy had the flu and he was anticipating it and wanted to know if I was available. And I said, yes. So I get to come hang out with some of my favorite people, and um, really glad to be here with you today. Been praying for you. I keep praying for you all the time, and talk to Scott and hear news about you, and of course on Facebook and everything. But it's always good to see you in person and to hang out with you and talk with you today about some really cool stuff from God's Word. Uh, I was uh, my son came home for Christmas. As many of you know, he he lives in Germany now. I'm getting comfortable with that sentence. For a while, it was like I said, he's a grad student in Germany. He was. He finished, he got the degree, and he stayed. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on the sentence now that my son lives in Germany until he decides to come back home. He's thinking about doing another, uh, doing a PhD there. If that happens, God knows when he'll come home. Anyway, so he was home at Christmas for about a month, and... Um, my amazing son-in-law, Alvaro, uh, uh, and, and my son, Trey, and I went down to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center uh, place down in uh, Huntsville. And then we also bought one of the like tour things to go to the Marshall Space Flight Center and just had like a really cool day doing rocket stuff and uh, really enjoyed it. And one of the really cool things that happened, we went over to the Marshall Sp Space Flight Center. And this is a recommendation I make to you. If you want to go tour uh, the Space Flight Center, the Marshall Space Flight Center, then uh, what you need to do is go in a time of year when there's not a lot of crowds so you have a small group and then bring along a nine-year-old girl okay because we had this really uh, just talkative inquisitive nine-year-old girl with us and so you know everybody wanted to talk to her and so we were in this one facility and we got to go to one side of it and see where they do like the International Space Station stuff but there was another side of it where the regular people don't get to go it's where they do the welding all right the welding for the big rocket cylinders that they put all the propellant in and everything but there was this guy who saw the inquisitive nine-year-old girl and he said listen normally people can't come back here but i want this little girl to see really cool stuff and you all can come too sure <laughs> And so we went to the really cool place where they're taking sheets of metal, 20 foot by 20 foot sheets of metal, and shaping them into what are going to be the cylinders that they put all the propellant in. And so this guy really loves welding. <laughs> I mean, really. And he's welding in ways you don't imagine. He showed us this machine that a technique they use for welding that over a 20 foot weld, they cannot have any more variance than one ten thousandth of an inch. That's pretty cool. That shows you the level of expertise that's going on on that kind of work that they do. But I'm digressing a bit. It really was cool going and seeing that. What was really cool for me about that time was uh, one of my favorite things for life has been stars and NASA and spaceships and always wished that I could have been an astronaut but it didn't work out for myself. I've told Donna that one of these days if they ever get that like suborbital flight thing worked out where it's a you know certain amount of money I'm going you know <laughs> get as close to space as I can get. So I've been thinking a lot about stars since I went down to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center and uh, a lot of cool things about this. I wanted to show you a picture, a little picture of some stars, if we could do that. We're going to talk today about the stars in God's eyes. And so this picture, this is the Milky Way galaxy. This is our home. You live there. You may not know it. But it's the Milky Way galaxy. There's about a hundred scientists. Nobody has ever actually counted them all, as you would imagine. But they're using, you know, the way people add up big numbers, people that do this for a living and look at stuff like this, Imagine that in the Milky Way galaxy, there are about 100 billion, that's with a B, 100 billion stars, okay? Now, we are somewhere over here on the edge, if we can bring up the arrow, we're over there, that's your neighborhood. You're a celestial neighborhood. You're living out there. Our little solar system, plant, plants are going around. Our sun's over there. And we're just swirling around the big Milky Way, this candy bar named Galaxy. Now, if you want for a second to look at that, and you can say that in our galaxy, scientists believe that there's about 100 billion stars. I don't know about you, but that makes my head hurt. 
trying to imagine a hundred billion of anything, much less a hundred billion stars. But let's stretch that a little bit more because these same scientists say that if you uh, were to be able to count all of the galaxies, like this is our galaxy, this is our home in the universe, that there are probably a hundred billion galaxies too. Those are big numbers. And it's hard to imagine that kind of space and what that's like, a hundred billion galaxies. But the thing that I want you to think about today, right now, is I want you to think about the stars, the sky full of stars. Uh, later this week on Thursday, I'm going to be going to Honduras like I do every year. And one of the things I love about going to Honduras is I go out there every night and there's no po noise, uh, light pollution up there in the mountains. And the stars I can see in Honduras... Ah, it's amazing. It takes your breath away. I want to talk about stars with you today. And I want you to keep that image in mind as we think a little, about, a little bit about Scripture. It's an old story in the Scripture that we'll be looking at today. It's kind of nestled up there in the beginning of the Bible. It's a story about a guy named Abram. And how he hears this amazing word from God. God's already been talking to him by this time in the Bible. God reaches out to him, has him move from, taps him on the shoulder and has him, tell him to pick up his whole family and move from his home to this strange land where he doesn't know anybody. And as the story kind of unpacks a little bit, um, there's uh, kind of some, some like struggles with foreign powers and foreign leaders. And then there's family struggles and um, they all finally come to an end at this point in Genesis 15 when he settles down with Sarah, his uh, childless wife in their 70s. He's wealthy beyond measure and then God shows up again. And this is the text that I want to look at with you today. It's Genesis chapter 15 and it's verses 1 through 6. And it tells us of a time when God says something really cool to Abram. So read along with me, if you will, as you see it up on the screen. This is um, Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. So Scripture says, so uh, sometime later, this is after all of the conflict and the squabbling and the family stuff and settling down. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision, and he said to him, Now don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, Oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all of my wealth. You've given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. And the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. And then the Lord took Abram outside, and he said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you'll have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Let's pray together. God, we know you've been at work across the ages. In our distracted and busy lives, God, give us eyes to see where you work even now in us and through us and for us. Bless this time, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So it's an important moment. This little snapshot of the biblical story is an important moment in the biblical story because it sets a foundation for the way God wants to work with people. And it frames this idea from the very beginning that God chooses people to be a part of his own. Uh, Scott has told me that uh, he's been working with you on belonging to God and we talked a little bit about that and I thought I would share this text with you today, this scripture with you as a way we think about what it means to belong to God and, and how when we belong to God together, how that changes each one of us. So as I was thinking about that theme, 
about belonging to God and remembering this particular story at the beginning of Scripture, I want to think a little bit about the stars in God's eye. In that moment when God takes Abram outside and they look into that Mediterranean sky and they see all the stars and, and what the stars in God's eye were for that moment and what it means to be a part of that. Now, you know, the story here, uh, Abram says to God quite boldly, when God says to him, you know, you're going to be blessed, he says, um, I don't know how that's going to happen, because I don't, have any, I don't have any children. And I began to think about this a little bit, and I thought, you know, first of all, one of the things for us to remember is that we are who we have been. And this is an important thing, that the who that we are right now is partly about who we have been. And this story of Abram is really an important backstory in the Bible because it says that God has picked Abram and God has said through Abraham, through you, my people will bless the earth, even old Abram as wealthy as he was, had in his mind the impoverishment of not having any children. Because in his world, if he didn't have any children, there was no one to give his wealth to and no one to take his name on, no way to be remembered. And he even complains to God here, look, you didn't give me any son. You said I'm blessed. I'm going to have to give everything away to Eliezer of Damascus, my, my servant, not my son. He says to God, Oh, Sovereign Lord, what good are all the blessings when I don't even have a son? Now, here's another picture for you. This one is my family. So I thought I'd show them to you a little bit, get to know a little bit about me. I never told you about these folks before. Um, this is my family on the far, on what will be your right. On the far right is my great grandpa, Joseph Copeland. He's a big man. What I remember about Joe Copeland, Joseph Copeland, is that his wedding ring was big enough it would go over a broomstick. Now, when you go home and you look at a broomstick, you'll see how big his hand was, how big this man was. Uh, my great-grandpa lived next door to me. He died when I was about seven years old. I, miss, I have these really vague memories of him as a childhood. Right next to him is Pearl. Uh, her name was Pearl Drennan when she got married. She's from the Drennan part of our family, but my mama's named after Pearl. Okay, and she's the one that raised my mom. So that's my great grandfather and my great -grand grandmother, Joe and Pearl Copeland. How cool is that? And all the folks to their right, as the picture goes this way, are their children. Okay? My great aunts and my great uncles. And just to the left of Pearl, this third person from this way, is my Uncle Frank. My Uncle Frank is definitely one of the godliest people I ever know in my life. He was married to my Aunt Delma. My sister was named after Delma. Uh, and, and my Uncle Frank is the man who signed my ordination certificate. And I remember when I was being ordained the ministry 40 years ago. I'd been preaching for 40 years as of last month. I remember Uncle Uncle Frank was there late in life and how important it was for me that Uncle Frank was there because he was one of the godliest men, deacon in this church for years and years. Right next to Uncle Frank is my Aunt Viola. Aunt Viola and Uncle Marsh lived in Dexter, Missouri. It was always a treat to go see them because they had been cooks on riverboats on the Mississippi River and could she ever cook food. And so I always knew that when we went to Aunt Viola's house we would have great feasts and great meals. Next to Aunt Viola is my Uncle, Uncle Milfred. He's the one you'll notice with no tie and the shirt untucked. That's Uncle Milford. He always kind of went to a beat of his own drummer. Uncle Milford told me years ago when I was in the ministry, he said, you can't ever charge anybody for a wedding or for a funeral because you're a pastor. And so for 40 years, I never had because of Uncle Milford. All right. He also signed my ordination certificate. Uh, I, I can't tell you the number of times I sat listening to him and him challenging me to love God and be faithful and to be true in the ministry that God has called me to. Right next to him is his twin brother, Uncle Wilfred. Milfred and Wilfred. The thing I remember about Wilfred was he had coon dogs. Loved to go to his house because he'd always hear his coon dogs bring and they always had wonderful dogs. It was great to go to his house when I was a kid. Right next to him is my daddy grandpa. Not my grandpa. My daddy grandpa. His name was Joseph Copeland too. Named after my great grandpa. But I called him daddy grandpa because in my dysfunctional family I had something like four grandpas and five grandmas. Okay, And I had a hard time separating them apart. And my mom always called her dad daddy. 
And so he was the daddy grandpa. And so all the way till he died about 10 years ago when he was 95 years old, I called him daddy grandpa. So that's my grandpa there. And then right next to him is Uncle, Uncle Vernon, Uncle Henry rather. Uncle Henry, my mom says everybody was probably there gathered for this meal because Uncle Henry lived in Spokane, Washington. He had gone away from the family, lived on the other side of the world in Spokane, Washington. He had come in for this big, big weekend. And so all the family got together for a big meal. Next to him is Uncle Henry. He's the youngest of the group. And he lived in DeSoto until he moved away to Phoenix, Arizona to retire. Now, my mom here, my mom tells me this picture was probably taken around 1950, early in the 50s. My mom was probably nine or ten years old, and I was literally just a twinkle in her eye. But when I look at these people, what I remember about them is that that's my family. And I could talk for hours about each one of those people and about that family and the Drennan side of my family and all the other parts. I'm not even going into my dad's side of the family. My mom's side of the family is much cooler, by the way. <laughs> Lots of stories to tell. But you see, that's my family. And for all the years that I've been preaching and all the things that I've done in ministry, it often feels to me like... Uncle Frank, Uncle Milford, Uncle Wilfred couldn't be in my ordination because he was sick that night, I remember. And Daddy Grandpa, Daddy Grandpa, Uncle Milford, and Uncle Frank all signed my ordination certificate. So whenever I preach, I really feel like they're with me. We are, you know, the kind of people who are who we are because of who we have been. You see, I am who I am because of my family and who and what they taught me about who I should be. Imagine what I've told you here is enough to bring back some memories of your own family. But here, here's the other part of this. See, there are biblical characters, too. This story starts us with Abram, and we later, we later begin to know him as Abraham. Now, he had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, who has a great other side story, a great backstory that whenever God told Sarah, Abraham's wife, that she was going to have a baby, she left. Ha, ha, because she was old. And so God said, all right, what? Call him Isaac, which means laughter. And then that star thing began to happen. You know, all the stars of the sky are like your descendants, Abraham, and all the twinkles in the eyes of God and the people of God began like the stars of heaven. And it's a big family, too, if you read the rest of Genesis and the way that Bible begins to unpack. Uh, Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and then Isaac has a son named Jacob, and Jacob has another brother named Esau, and uh, they kind of get in a little bit, and Jacob runs away from Esau and takes the inheritance with him, goes up north to some other family, and has a story goes he has lots of sons he has enough sons that make the 12 tribes of of the people of israel and then one of those sons as you know the story kind of gets like sold into slavery and he ends up in egypt and he becomes the right hand man of the pharaoh of egypt and they saved all of god's people during famine and they came and lived in egypt and then joseph died and others died and other pharaohs died that didn't remember joseph and then before you know it all of god's people were in slavery in egypt remember this story and then an orphan raises up uh, rises up a guy named moses and, and moses Moses helps lead them through the waters of a big sea and across the desert and through all kinds of perils and dangers and hunger and dehydration and gets to the edge of the promised land and God says, you can't cross. And he taps a guy named Joshua on the shoulder and says, Joshua, lead him across the finish line that is the Jordan River and bring all of God's people home. And the rest of the story, all of these people who are in the back story of the stars of God's eyes, there's kings and there's queens and there's scoundrels and there's heroes and all of them are living out their life until this little girl this little girl comes on the scene and she has a baby in the most amazing way. And they called him Jesus. And that star in God's eye changed everything. See, we're all part of that story, that big, great story of Scripture and everything that happened in between. We are who we have been. But we're also who we are. We are who we are as well. Now, God has stars in his eyes. And he knows old Abraham will make people for God. 
And, and the who that we are that comes out of that moment long ago brings us to here. Our story, my story, your story. We're right in the middle of a big story of the stars of God's eyes. When you read about all of the people who have been the stars in God's eyes and a part of the story of God, you might take some comfort in knowing that many of them often have been pretty challenged in making good decisions. I think it's great that God has tremendous patience with us. You see, God's got stars in his eyes and God's playing the long game. And God has great divine patience with all of us. Now, when you read the Old Testament in particular, you, can, you get marvelous illustrations and wonderful stories about the way the who we are part of that never quite gets things right. Okay? That we're often struggling with things here or there. There's this great scripture in Isaiah 58 where God calls out God's people for pretending to worship and for pretending to live faithfully and pretending to love people they don't love. And God reminds them of their fighting with each other and they're treating their workers badly and about their pretending to repent and keeping their own same lifestyle. And so this is what God says in Isaiah 58, 6. He says, now, now, now this is the kind of fasting I want or the kind of worship and faithfulness. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. If you do that, God says, and when you call on me, if you do those things, then I'll say, yes, I'm here. Whatever it is about our lives that never quite measure up. And we all wrestle with that. That's the who we are. Uh, whatever it is about our lives that never quite measure up. It's good for us to know that God kept working with God's people until God pressed the restart button and sent Jesus. Paul writes in Romans, he says that the who we are is that all of us are sinners. That we have a selfishness to us. And that sometimes we're so focused on ourselves we don't think a lot about God or even other people. Because it's all about me. That's the who we are. That's the biblical story. And there's a lot of that that's borne out across history. And a lot of that's borne out today that we see that. That there's a part of who we are that makes us pretty focused on our own interests. Maybe we do the things that we do, the selfishness, the sinful behavior, the frustrating honoriness that we sometimes have. Maybe we do it because we learned it from other people, you see. Maybe the who we have been. Some of us have family members. Uh, if I were to tell you about my family member, my brother has a person, my, my father has a brother whom I refer to as he who shall not be named. Anybody have like that in your family? Okay? So we all have those parts of our family, and sometimes we learn things from them we don't want to learn. But that's part of it. We're always trying to wrestle with who we are. I love this song. I always love worshiping with you all. And I love this last song, the phrase, Once I was broken, but you loved my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me because your grace holds me now. What a great line. I once was broken, but you loved my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me because your grace holds me now. That's the who that we are. That was the plan. That is the plan. That will be the plan. The good thing, God has a plan. Remember, God has stars in God's eyes. This is the last thing I want to share with you. Not only are we who we have been and who we are, but we are also who we will be, you see. The story didn't end 
with Abraham. I try to teach my students, I try to encourage people to read the Bible with imagination. And Genesis 15 says that the Lord takes Abram outside. What a great little detail. And so I imagine the Lord taking Abram outside, standing close to him and putting an arm around his shoulders. I said, hey, Abram, look there at the sky. See all those stars, man? Your descendants are going to be like that. Abram's an old man. He's in his 70s. No children. <coughs> Wealthy beyond measure, but no children. God says, Abram, look at all those stars out there. Your descendants are like that. And I kind of imagine in that moment, this wry smile comes across Abram's face when he imagines what just might be. See, this is the wonder of God's grace, is that we get stuck in who we are. And we don't imagine who we can be. And God's the one saying, look, I'm looking way out there for you. I want you to see just whom you can be. And a long time, you see, after God stood outside with his arm around Abram's shoulder and told Abram to look up in the skies and say, you know, your descendants are going to be like that. One of those stars in the sky, one of those descendants of Abraham was a guy named Saul who became a follower of Jesus Christ after he had done everything he could to, to kill people who were following Jesus. But he became a follower and he changed his name to Paul. He asked God to make him whole. He turned his life around. He decided to follow Jesus. And then he ended up writing most of our New Testament. And one of my favorite places in the New Testament is this letter he wrote to people in a province called Galatia, kind of where Turkey is today. And he wrote this letter to them. And at one point in chapter 4, he reminds them about Abram. He says, you remember who Abram was and Abram's two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And remember what happened with both of them and how Isaac became a promise of how God would bless people through his life. And Isaac is all about the freedom of God. Never forget that, Paul says. And then says this, Paul has this great line, really great line. In Galatians chapter 5, 1, where he says, Christ, he says, remember this, folks, Christ has truly set you free. Now make sure you stay free. What a great line. All of us look to our families in the past, and we know that we're... You know, if it's not happened to you, you know, if you're under 20, if this has not happened to you yet, it will happen to you. One day, you will look in the, in the mirror, and you will see your mother or your father, and it will scare you. <laughs> and not only are we physically a product of parents, but our behaviors and our ideas and our values are. And, and some of us are blessed by that and some of us are challenged by that. And some of that leads into the kind of decisions we make as human beings that challenges actually who we are. And isn't it a wonderful thing that God has healed our broken hearts all the way through and God has given us grace. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And that's what makes it so wonderful that we have this opportunity to be free. And so Paul's reminding that. Paul's all about grace. Galatians is all about grace. And so when he writes in Galatians 4, he says, listen to this. Wherever you've been, don't get caught up in all the things you've done wrong in the rules. But remember that God has wiped all that clean and you are now free. Free is a wonderful thing. And so here's the really, really cool thing. I've been wanting, I want to show you this. Here's the, the thing, folks, the really, really cool thing. Let me show you the stars in God's eyes. Look at this. You. Do you see that? Do you understand that you are the stars in God's eyes? So long ago, 
when God put his arm around Abraham and looked up into that Mediterranean sky and said, your descendants will be like the stars in the sky. Paul says to all of the Christians, you are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Folks, you are the stars in God's eyes. If you want to know you belong to God, you have been belonging to God. Since that night, when God put his arm around Abram's shoulders and said, look what you're going to make. Take a deep breath. Let go of all the spin cycles in the news. Okay? Just, gosh, they grind away at us. Reminding us of the worst of what it means to be a human being. Reminding us of our pettiness and all of our own sort of like issues. Um, stop worrying about labeling people or being labeled. Let go of everything that you've been grabbing for and trying to hang on to. Yes, you failed yourself and others. Right? Yes. You have regrets. Yes, you have been. You are. And you can be forgiven. Take a deep breath with me. Do this. Go. Cool. We don't do this enough. You are already in the future that God saw for you. You're already forgiven for God has already worked in you, is working in you, and will work in you. You are the stars in God's eyes. And He has been looking for you for ages. Welcome home, people of God. You stars in the eyes of God, welcome home.